Daniel. Yes, we're in Daniel. For those of you visiting, we've been working our way through Daniel, and, and up until a week before last, we had gone through the first six chapters. And those first, chap, first six chapters were mostly historical, the life of what it was like in, in, while the Jews were in exile uh, in Babylon. And now we're working into chapter 7 through 12 that are prophetic. So the first six chapters are mostly historical with a little bit of prophecy. And the final six chapters are mostly prophecy with a little bit of history worked in there. There are several means we use to verify the accuracy and the authenticity of the Bible. Um, you know, we could use our experiences to say, yes, the Bible is true because of what has changed in us as we've read it. The downside of that is other faiths can argue that as well. Muslims read the Quran and they say their life has changed. And the Scientologists can say, well, we've read L. Ron Hubbard and our life has changed. So, so that is an exclusive to the Bible. Another way we could verify the uh, authenticity of the Bible and the accuracy of the Bible is historically. Every year it seems that archaeologists are digging up more and more evidence to support the historical accounts of the Bible. Up until the 1890s, in fact, most scholars thought that the book of Daniel was nothing but a mythical story. And so they discounted it until um, excavations proved that there were these folks named in, in Daniel. But really, the single most impressive way that verifies the accuracy of the Bible is fulfilled prophecy. Only God, who is outside of time, can reveal the future. Only God, who is sovereign over everything, can orchestrate history to, his, to serve his purposes. So as we look at our Bible, we read Isaiah 53, some 500 years before Christ, excuse me, 700 years before the crucifixion, Isaiah describes the condition of Christ during that crucifixion. He foresees that. I mean, that was centuries before the torturous execution means of crucifixion was even developed. And then we see, we've seen in Daniel chapter two, where Daniel reveals Nebuchadnezzar's dream and there's a statue of the four different metals and the different kingdoms represented by those metals. And we can look back and see that Babylon, the head of gold, the chest and arms of silver being the Medes and Persians, the waistband, the torso of bronze being the Greeks, and the legs of iron being Rome. And so we can look on that and we can see that fulfilled. And there are these advertisements we see for investments, right? They'll say invest in this, and what's the disclaimer at the bottom? Past performance is no guarantee of future earnings. Well, it's just the opposite with God, folks. When God fulfills the prophecies, when we can see the prophecies have been fulfilled, those that are in the Bible that have yet to be fulfilled will be because God is trustworthy and God is the one performing this guarantee. So we could say God's past performance is a guarantee of future results. So now, these, the Bible video, Bible project video we saw here this morning stated that prophecy can be a bit difficult to understand because there's a lot of symbolism. And especially so if it's not interpreted within the whole of the Bible. We pick and choose the little statements that we want to hang our hats on and, and we could be entirely wrong. Yeah. 
In addition to that, much of the is ancient poetry. And I'm not big on interpreting modern poetry, let alone ancient poetry. John Calvin, he died in 1564. John Calvin said that the Bible is basically God's baby talk to us. We've got God with an infinite mind, an infinite wisdom, trying to speak to finite minds and finite understanding. Not only finite, but to ancient minds. When he spoke to these ancient prophets, they had no idea what modernity would bring. If God had shown an ancient prophet a vision of an Abrams tank, an Apache helicopter, or a Reagan-class aircraft carrier, how would they describe it? They'd have no basis in which to describe that to their peers. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not stating that all those things are what God revealed. I'm not equating the helicopters to giant locusts, because I don't know. So, as you got your Bibles out, let's go ahead and turn to Daniel chapter 7. And, and what we're going to do is read through the entire chapter today, and then we'll, we'll hope to get up to verse 14. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream, and visions passed through his mind as he was lying on his bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, in my vision at night I looked, and there before me were four winds of heaven, churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the other, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion, and it had wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a man, and the heart of a man was given to it. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that, I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. And on its back, it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth that spoke boastfully. And as I looked, thrones were set in place and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, his hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire and his wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority but were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of the st those standing there and asked him the true meaning of all this. So he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kingdoms that will rise from the earth, but the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. 
yes, forever and ever. Then I wanted to know the true meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others and most terrifying. With its iron teeth and bronze claws, the beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up before which three of them fell. The horn that looked more imposing than the others and that had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came when they possessed the kingdom. He gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, another kingdom will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his saints and try to change the times, set times and the laws. The saints will be handed over to him for a time, times and half a time. But the court will sit and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints, the people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. This is the end of the matter. I, Daniel, was deeply troubled in my thoughts, and my face turned pale, but I kept the matter to myself. Father, we do praise you and thank you for the gift that is your word. We pray during this time, Lord, that you would give your people the power of understanding, that you would give the one in the pulpit the power to reveal your word. We pray also for the one in the pulpit that you would forgive him his sins, for there are many. Remind us here, Lord, that we come here to draw near to Jesus and to him only, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. So very quickly, in the very first year uh, line, Daniel puts a date stamp on this. It's the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. And if you remember, Belshazzar was the king in place when Babylon fell. So this happened somewhere between chapter 4 and chapter 5 chronologically. Nebuchadnezzar is dead. And there have been several kings in the interim, and now Belshazzar is ruling. Um, his father is off in Arabia somewhere, and so Daniel's here, and he has this dream revealed to him. And so he records, in, in the NIV, it says the substance of the dream. If you're in the King James, it... Uh, it's also a sum, or in the NASB, it's a summary of what he saw. Now, the question might come up in your mind at this point. Why would God provide a vision to Daniel at this time? Well, number one reason is, you can go back to chapter 1, verse 17, is because Daniel was equipped to understand dreams and visions, Right? And Daniel can understand visions and dreams of all kinds, is what we were told in, in chapter 1. But why now? Well, Judah now had been captive 50, 60 years. They were once exiles in this grand kingdom, this grand empire of Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. And as Nebuchadnezzar died, the kingdom lost its glory. And they're probably beginning to think, has God forgotten us? Is God not keeping his promises? They know that Jerusalem had been leveled by the Babylonians. They know that the temple had been leveled by the Babylonians. And they're exiled in this strange land and if they've been paying attention, is due to their sin. But they're wondering if Jeremiah was right. If it's only going to be 70 years. 
they're starting to question whether the promises that God made to them early in their history that Robbie read this morning about God speaking to Israel and saying, hey, they're going to be a great nation. Go ahead and, and go to Egypt. They're beginning to question that. And so this is a message that would bring hope to the exiles in Babylon. This is a confirmation of that chapter 2 revelation in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Of the four kingdoms, the four empires coming through, and then this stone not cut from human hands that comes and crushes all kingdoms. This is a reminder for God's people. Verse 2, Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. And so this great sea is indicative of the Gentile nations, and the wind is the chaos that stirs among them. Verse 2, four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. And we'll see that the, each beast has an equivalent to the metals in the statue of chapter 2. Verse 4, the first was like a lion, it had wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground, so that it stood on two feet like a man, and the heart of a man was given to it. I mentioned before in the 1890s, the archaeologist Coldaway came and excavated Babylon, and he uncovered a great hallway, and along that hallway were mosaics of lions. So the empire Babylon was likened to a lion and with the wings there's that maj majesty but here it said the wings were pulled off and that means a majesty that once was Babylon is being diminished when Nebuchadnezzar died and then the raised up on two legs had to do with Nebuchadnezzar remember in chapter 4 Nebuchadnezzar is given the mind of an animal eating grass and then he turns his eyes towards heaven and his sanity is restored and he's given what the heart of a man and so he's standing up in two legs so that equates to the head of gold in daniel chapter 2 verse 5 and therefore there before me was a second beach which beast which looked like a bear it was raised up on one of its sides it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, it was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. So this beast corresponds to the next kingdom, the empire in charge, which is the Medes and Persians. That chest of silver and arms of silver. And whatever your opinions are of the animal kingdom, I think we can agree that a bear isn't quite as majestic as a lion. It's powerful and it's vicious. But you can't say that a bear is grace, graceful or as swift as a lion. It seems to be a lumbering beast, but it's powerful. And as Daniel describes this bear being raised up on one side, it's telling us if it's a Medes and Persians that one side is stronger than the other. And it began, the Medes and Persians actually began with the Medes being more powerful than the Persians. And then Cyrus came up and raised the Persians up. So that balance was changed. And so that's why the bear is kind of one-sided here. And the three ribs are understood by scholars to mean the conquering of three kingdoms. And that would be Egypt, Lydia, which is now Turkey, and then finally Babylon. Verse 6, after that I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. And on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads and was given authority to rule. And again, we see it corresponding to the next empire foretold in Daniel chapter 2, and that's the Greeks under Alexander the Great. And if you're a student of history, you understand that what was different about the Greeks is how quickly they advanced and, and conquered the other kingdoms and empires. So that four wings would be symbolic of speed and swiftness. But this beast has four heads. Well, Alexander the Great died 
in his mid-30s from alcoholism. And so that Greek kingdom had been split up into the four generals. Scholars believe that's what that is indicative of. Verse 7, after that, my vision at night, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had a large iron teeth that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. And this corresponds to the fourth kingdom from Daniel chapter 2, that of Rome and of iron. The legs of iron and very powerful, just trampled everything in it. The Roman Empire lasted until the 5th century AD. And now Daniel takes a break. Or he, he, he focuses on this little horn in verse 8. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them. And three of the first horns were un, uprooted before it. The horn had eyes like eyes of a man, a mouth that spoke boastfully. With my limited understanding of the interpretation of prophecy. I'm told that the prophecies can have dual application. So this applies to the Roman Empire, but it also will apply to the end of time. The horns speak of rulers, kings, that are in power at the time. And so this prophecy here speaks not only of the Roman domination of the time of Daniel, or excuse me, after Daniel, the time of Christ, the probability that there will be some sort of Roman influence on the end times as well. And, and we're going to be going back in these and in, in touching these more specifically in future messages. Verse 9, as I looked, thrones were set in place and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne flaming with fire and wheels and were all ablaze. And so when we look at that passage, it's the Ancient of Days. We speaking specifically about God. And if you want to look for another explanation of that vision of God, you can go to Ezekiel, first chapter of that. I'm not going to read through that today. We're getting a little pushed on time. I want you to see verse 10b. The court was seated and the books were opened. So we've moved from the Roman Empire in ancient times, 500 A.D., all the way to the end of time, the judgment time. That's quite a jump. There's nothing, there's no indication of even the church in this prophecy. But it's judgment time. Verse 11. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words of the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. And verse 12, the other beasts, which had stripped of their authority, but were allowed to live for a period of time. Remember when each kingdom, which each empire took over, they didn't just wipe everybody out. Those kingdoms were absorbed into the new empire. And, and this horn that they're talking about here is the same horn as the Antichrist described by John in chapter 13 of Revelation. Horn meaning the kings or rulers. And here, folks, we get into verse 13. 13 and 14, that really is the key theme of this chapter. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and led into his presence. 
He was given authority and glory and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom will be one that will never be destroyed. Folks, this is a scene of the coronation of Jesus Christ after his second coming. This is the key passage in this chapter. And it's really easy, really easy for us to get distracted by the horns and the message. And, and we want to know, we want to know who the beast is going to be, don't we? We want to know what's going to happen in the end times. When in fact, our real focus should be on Christ. We can get distracted with that. In fact, there's denominations that will every few years, you'll see flyers all over, come and see what we know about the revelation. And it's a distraction to the point that we need to be focused on Christ. Jesus called himself the son of man over 60 times in the gospels, referring back to this chapter, this verse, where Daniel refers to the Son of Man being crowned. It's also the rock from chapter 2, that rock cut not by human hands, but by divine hands, a rock that crushes all kingdoms, all empires as we know them. This is the coronation where Jesus in Matthew 28 can say, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have taught you. 